This is a virtual presentation on obstacles in multilingual translingual approaches to teaching writing at a monolingual American university by Thomas Walker and Ahmad al Harti, University of Washington. Simply put, translingualism is an approach to language, but if we would like to define it more clearly, we would have to contrast it with previous approaches to language and teaching, namely, to monolingualism and multilingualism, to see how the three differ from one another. For example, a monolingual orientation, otherwise described by scholars as code segregation or the inference model, views differences in multilingual writing as a deficit, alluding all errors made by students in their writing to their first language. On the other hand, a multilingual orientation to languages, otherwise described as code switching or the correlationist model, views difference as an estrangement. So while this position can be considered an improvement over the first model in the sense that it acknowledges the existence of language differences, it does not engage with those differences critically enough. This is what a translingual orientation to language attempts to do. Described as the negotiation model, or code meshing, translingualism encourages users' agency, promotes linguistic heterogeneity, and fights monolingual policies that do not reflect the nature of language use and language relation. In other words, it assumes that languages are dynamic and interactive rather than static and discrete, and therefore the presence of language differences is considered not only normal but also desirable. One way to look at the difference between these three approaches is to view them as, respectively, conservative, liberal, and progressive. Now, while the term itself might be relatively new, at least in composition studies, it has been in use in several other academic disciplines, including applied linguistics, sociolinguistics, new literacy studies, comparative literature, and translation studies. As pointed out, translingualism believes in the naturalness of variation. This view puts all varieties in relation to standard English, or all languages in relation to English, on the same equal footing and contributes to more equal power sharing between various linguistic codes. Some scholars view this point as a drawback, thinking that translingualism dangerously ignores standard English and therefore prevents students' access to a variety that will prove beneficial to them in the real world. But the reality is that this is merely a misconception about the approach in question. More accurately, translingualism tries to deconstruct the ideology informing standard English, making students aware of the fact that it is a social construct that was privileged at one point in the history of the English language. The presenters are both composition instructors at the University of Washington, and examining our students' initial introductory essays shows that unsolicited traces of monolingual ideology are startlingly common. For example, in a recent quarter, several students express a lack of confidence about their English abilities, particularly because they learn varieties of English that they feel have become adulterated in some way, such as Chinglish or Singlish. Another student equates being an international student with having weak vocabulary and grammar knowledge, and assumes that all Americans naturally speak English better than he does. One student feels embarrassed by her non-American accent, and another feels that her English only improved when, in her own country, she was able to learn from foreigners. The desire to connect with our students during this first writing exercise has dominated our reading of their responses. Instead of finding ways to resist the monolingual ideology exhibited in our students' responses, our own responses to their writing reveal a tacit acceptance that one language is the norm of human linguistic behavior and a continued privileging of the native, quote-unquote, varieties of English over other varieties. The former is exhibited in this comment, quote, I am impressed that you are taking English, Spanish, and French classes all at once. Make sure that your brain doesn't explode with all of those languages in there at once, end quote while the latter is exhibited in this response. Thank you for your initial essay. I also hope that I can teach you some nifty and native idioms this quarter." Unquote. It seems that our desire to build a rapport with our students trumps our desire to immediately challenge monolingualism. The institution of a writing section specifically for multilingual learners at the University of Washington is framed by macro-level language policies that subordinate other linguistic codes to prestige dialects of English. 
The active promotion of the English language by the governments of English dominant countries and the economic hegemony of English speaking corporations, which demand English speaking management. Have contributed to larger and larger numbers of international students seeking degrees from U.S. institutions of higher learning. At the University of Washington, these international students are at once courted for the economic benefits they bring, yet forced to bear, almost entirely on their own, the burden of linguistic accommodation. By this, we mean that these students are required to learn the dialect and registers of the university's language, with almost no expectation that the university faculty or general student body will accommodate the students' existing language competencies. What accommodation the university provides is generally in the form of extra counseling and special tutoring in order that these students more swiftly learn the local variety of English. Indeed, in a recent survey of teaching assistants and faculty at the University of Washington, only 29% of the teaching assistants and 33% of the faculty felt that international and multilingual students' ability to read and write in other languages was a benefit that such students brought to their classes. This ethos of asymmetrical accommodation is apparent in the university's 2013 institution of a $45 international student fee. A fee which was justified in large part on the need to support the increasingly heavy use of international student services. This sort of action reflects the attitude that international students are, as a community, more burdensome than other student groups, as well as the notion that it is the responsibility of international students to seek out and pay for the services that will help make up their presumed deficiencies, particularly deficiencies in English. Given such an environment, with prestige dialects of English being privileged almost to the exclusion of other forms of language use, it is no surprise that students may begin to see their multilingual language background as a weakness rather than a strength. We even had a student during the fall quarter of 2015 write an essay on why, as a student at the University of Washington, it would be much better to be monolingual in English than to be multilingual. Seeing one's multilingualism as a weakness is a clear indication of a monolingual ideology at work and attempts to claim multilingualism as a source of power within such a monolingual framework may have unexpected results. Recently, the terms multilingual learner and multilingual writer have been widely adopted to describe international, generation 1.5, and other linguistic minority students. These labels have become popular precisely because they emphasize the strengths of students' linguistic backgrounds rather than the deficit perception invoked by terms such as English language learner, which foreground the language shortcomings of a student, rather than the students themselves as resourceful agents. Yet some scholars have also observed that this change in nomenclature, while attempting to promote the language abilities of some students, may have the unintended side effect of further normalizing monolingualism. This reinforces the idea that a normal, quote-unquote, American student is not multilingual and that L1 speakers of English who have learned other languages are themselves not truly multilingual. In addition to transmitting these explicit traces of monolingual ideology, our students' writing in the preliminary assignment reveals the pressure of another force that may be obstructing translingual approaches in our courses, namely the need to eventually assign a grade to student work. Although none of our prompting questions mentions grades, quite a few of our students bring the topic up on their own in response to our questions about their writing. Unsurprisingly, grades are a powerful motivator as well as a potential source of discouragement for our students. There is nothing about translingualism that precludes grading. However, adopting a translingual approach to teaching writing demands a change from the monolingual tendencies of, quote, traditional, unquote, grading. Since translingual approach to teaching writing does not automatically treat differences from the norm as errors, and that writers' goals and readers' expectations are not fixed or monolithic. If, as translingual scholar Min Zan Lu suggests, a phrase like, quote, can able to, unquote, ought to be treated as a potential source of idiomatic meaning ra rather than automatically dismissed as an error, then it would seem that assessment must necessarily be a complex, thoughtful process even for non-standard grammar choices. However, it is easy to see why, in a sample of faculty comments on nearly 600 student papers from over 30 different departments at a single university, that Stern and Solomon, in 2006, 
found that the faculty were overwhelmingly, quote, providing feedback on technical writing components such as spelling, grammar, and word choice, unquote, rather than on content, because these are the, quote, types of errors that are fairly easy to detect and take relatively little effort to correct, unquote. Page 38. A monolingual ideology which establishes a clear line between correct and incorrect is an ever-present temptation to a writing instructor pressed to assign a grade or give decisive feedback. In some ways, our assignment prompts clearly support the translingual imperative to read through error to get at meaning. Each prompt comes with a box chart rubric, and the majority of these criteria are based on content rather than on form. However, these assignment prompts do not call students to draw upon their diverse linguistic resources, and they likewise do little to disrupt existing linguistic hierarchies. In fact, the prompt for one of our assignments, despite giving students the chance to pick any audience, including one from a non-English speaking country, explicitly states that the paper must still be in English. This apparently pragmatic rule is based on two related notions. One, an instructor cannot offer meaningful feedback to writing in a language that he or she does not understand. And two, the goal of this particular course is to improve not just writing, but English language writing. Without controverting these ideas, how might we still foster in our students the translingual ability to use the diverse linguistic resources as tools for meaning making? The main implication from this brief look at composition at the University of Washington is that teachers who wish to adopt a more translingual approach must immediately contend with a variety of inherited obstacles. While individual teachers have a very limited control over the global monolingual hegemony, the impact of this hegemony on students' attitudes towards English writing can immediately be mitigated through an explicit acknowledgement that monolingualism is ideological, not natural or normal. An early statement to this effect, in class and in the core syllabus, would better enable writing instructors to build rapport with their students while still calling attention to problematic monolingual ideals in their early writing. Institutional circumstances may also be difficult to control, but resistance is possible once discriminatory policies have been identified. The presenters participated in coordinating resistance to their university's international student fee, and this fee was recently ended. Labels like multilingual that are used to categorize large numbers of diverse students will always be problematic, but their harmful discursive effects can likewise be mitigated through a more transparent acknowledgement among students, instructors, and administrators that they are problematic. While grades are firmly entrenched in most universities' bureaucracies, the problems discussed above can be reduced through curricular changes. For example, the curriculum for the course we teach deflects some of the temptation to grade in the quick and easy monolingual style by postponing all assignment grading until the very end of the course, when the bulk of a student's grade will be determined by a holistic evaluation of a writing portfolio. The presenters have also participated in efforts to change the goals of composition to further de-emphasize the role of uncritical grammatical conformity. Composition instructors can likewise offer assignments that invite students to take their non-English language resources as a topic and allow students to write parts of their essays in another language and then to translate and annotate their own writing, as well as to reflect on the differences in writing in English and the other language. Introducing assignments of this sort can help students harness more of their linguistic resources. This concludes our virtual presentation. Thank you.